This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Ask the Expert. As always, I'm your host, Steph Storr, and I'm excited today. I'm excited to say, sorry about that. I'm excited to say that today's topic drummed up a lot of excitement with our listeners. We have historical writer, lecturer, and head of medieval records at the National Archives, Sean Cunningham here to discuss the one and only Arthur Tudor. Welcome to the show, Sean. Hello. Great to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. Oh, thanks for coming. So I think that the reason that Arthur Tudor got everyone so pumped up this time is because there's just so much that we don't know about him. So for those listening who aren't familiar with him, Arthur Tudor was King Henry VII's oldest son who was being prepped to become king himself. As we know, he obviously did not become King Arthur as he passed early, and his brother Henry went on to become King Henry VIII. So before we get to the questions that we received from our listeners, what else can you tell us, Sean, about Arthur that we might need to know just for some background on maybe the questions that we're going to hear in a little while. Yeah, it's it's one of the great kind of untold stories, I suppose, that really defines how the Tudor period unfolds, because obviously, having had a Prince of Wales very early in the Tudor period um, in 1486, it really set the tone for quite a secure outlook for Henry VII. You know, he had an heir quite early. The heir incorporated a lot of the ancestry of his rivals, the House of York, through his mother, Princess Elizabeth, then Queen Elizabeth. But um, but it actually all went wrong for Henry when Arthur died. So everything had to shift onto Henry VIII's shoulders, Prince Henry as he was then. So it meant that the, the regime set off in one direction and then had to change course after only 15 years. And of course, that set the tone for what happened later in the 16th century, because Henry VIII was always looking back to his brother as a point of reference, because Arthur had had all of the training and all of the attention and all of the independence. Henry had lived at court and been very much focused on becoming a courtier and learning the, the political game of dealing with people. We don't really know what Arthur was doing on a day-to-day basis in his own mini kingdom on the Welsh marches, but we know he was being trained to rule independently and from a very early age. So I think when he got married in 1501 at the age of 15, that was really an indication that he was ready in the king's eyes to become a ruler himself. So that period of training is really important because it really sets it sets out what we might expect the next Tudor king to have looked like after Henry VII, and it certainly wasn't Henry VIII. So it's an interesting what-if kind of story. You know, had Arthur fulfilled all his potential, been able to implement all of his training, what kind of king would he have been? And how different would he have been to his brother who did rule after him? This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty. And click become a patron for details. All right, back to the show. All right. So we we started off, I know that you had mentioned his training to become king. So let's see if we can go. We really have so many questions from listeners today. It's so great that everybody was so excited about it. But let's see if we can break this down maybe chronologically. So we'll start off with how you had said that he had been being prepped for becoming king while his brother Henry was maybe not so much. What does that actually mean? What does it look like when a son of a king is being groomed to become the next king. It's very much a a grand plan, I suppose, and it starts even before Arthur is born. So in August of um, 1486, a year after Henry VII becomes king, he moves the whole court to Winchester and the queen is expected to give birth there. And Henry VII is banking all of his future on this child being a boy and being the prince that his regime desperately needs. He's already seen some early flourishes of rebellion against him. So he knows that he needs a kind of magnet for loyalty as somebody he can build his own power around. Because remember, Henry VII has a fairly indistinct claim to the throne. He's really building everything on his victory at the Battle of Bosworth and his promise to marry Elizabeth of York, who has her own strong ancestry back through the Plantagenet line and the Mortimers and back through all the the Lancastrian and 
the Yorkist kings. So Henry is kind of a bit of an outsider in terms of how politics has worked up to that point. So everything is kind of filtered into Prince Arthur as as the future of the Tudor dynasty, really, although Henry's only been on the throne for a year, he's really looking to the longer term. And we can tell this is true because of the way Arthur's birth and christening is presented as a kind of heraldic, um, again, pageant, really, I suppose, of, of British kingship. So Henry is, is building Arthur, even in his name, to be connected to these ancient rulers of Britain, King Arthur, and the stories that would have been very familiar to people through Geoffrey of Monmouth, and Thomas Mallory and William Caxton had, had published the death of, of King Arthur only a couple of years before. So it was a story that was very much in, in the public domain. So c- selecting Arthur as a name for his firstborn son really stamped Henry VII's idealism onto the kingship he wanted to, to build. And Arthur was meant to kind of inherit the, the qualities of King Arthur through the stories. So a real paragon of kingship, a real idol in terms of the power and the, the, the type of rule that Henry wanted his son to, to take forwards. So that kind of sets the tone for what the prince will become, and therefore it, it really tells us what kind of education he would have had. So within even a few weeks of his birth, he is sent to live at Farnham Palace, which is a palace that the Bishop of, of Exeter, uh, Farnham Palace, which is a a palace that the Bishop of Winchester has, um, and basically Arthur sets himself up, or is set up as a, a mini independent household there. He has his own servants, not very many, but most importantly, he has a, a nursery with the same nursery staff that had, had nursed the Queen and the Yorkists in the 1470s and 80s. So Henry, again, is relying on these people whom his wife is familiar with to kind of rework the blueprint that the Yorkist children had had, Edward IV's children, and to some extent possibly Richard III's, but really Edward IV through his um, his daughter Elizabeth, now married to Henry VII, is becoming the kind of um, exemplar that Henry VII wants to follow for his own son. So Arthur is brought up in, in Farnham Palace till he's about three years old. We have little examples of his of his learning. We know his first tutor gave him a very rudimentary education, but we don't really know his name. And then he has John John um, John Reed. We have John Reed as Arthur's first known tutor, who was a former schoolmaster at Winchester College. And he teaches Arthur a bit more of the classical education, the new learning that's coming out of Italy and France through new printed sources. So again, they're making the most of the rediscovery of classical texts like Virgil and um, Socrates and all the, the great Roman and Greek authors. So they're being circulated in print for the first time, really, in this period. So Arthur is benefiting from that. He spends about three years at Farnham, and in the spring of 1493, he's moved to Ludlow Castle, which is on the Welsh marches between Shrewsbury and Worcester. And it's where it's an area of the country which is still a little bit of a frontier, still a little bit um, underpopulated and slightly wild in terms of its link into the, the Welsh Principality lands, the Prince of Wales's lands, but also what, what would be called the Welshry or the, the kind of non-English lands. So it's a frontier society where Arthur can learn how to become a king in terms of managing land, running the law, looking after estates, but most of all having his own court and learning how to deal with people as a leader and a ruler. So even by the time he's 10 years old, he is beginning to incorporate lots of the elements that a, a, a prince would need at this particular period. And it would be very standard and similar across Europe, I guess, because they're looking at those same texts. And Arthur is educated at this stage by Bernard Andre, who's um, Henry VII's court poet, but he's uh, an Oxford scholar. He's kind of linked to Margaret Beaufort. It's, again, part of the, the grand plan and the blueprint for how the Tudor hierarchy want their children to be educated but it's very clearly using what Edward IV had done for his Prince of Wales Edward um, who became Edward V but obviously was displaced by Richard III in 1483 and never got to rule for more than a few weeks so the education the model is already set down by the Yorkists and Henry just drops Arthur into this structure but it does mean that there's there's people and institutions and responsibilities and functions that Arthur has to absorb. And obviously, he's too young to do this in person. So there's a council, Council of the Marches in Wales is set up for him. 
and that acts a bit like the Royal Council, advising, dealing with petitions and complaints, but also it's a, a training ground for Arthur's companions, so his courtiers, the friends of the king and the sons of, of nobles would be sent to Arthur's household to learn how to become courtiers. And quite often it's the second sons of the, the high nobility or the lords. So the first sons might go to the king's court, but the second sons might go to Arthur's. And when we see this happening um, during Arthur's early teenage years and at his actual funeral, the list of people who were companions to him really shows that there's a plan here to build a kind of network or affinity for Arthur into the future. So it's very interesting that, again, the king is controlling this. Maybe Margaret Beaufort is, is as well, because she's invested most of her life in seeing her son on the throne. And the next Tudor king is really the way all of these strands are brought together hopefully in a very secure and peaceful transition of power. So Arthur is, is prepared to be king in the image of his own father, but he's actually looking back a, a generation to the Yorkist kings and the plans that Edward IV had for his own son, Edward, one of the princes in the tower. So that's an interesting link again between the Tudors and the Plantagenets in the earlier 15th century. And it shows that Henry VII is trying to absorb a lot of these uh, legitimate and um, strong claims to rule, um, which he doesn't possess personally, but he's relying on his wife um, to, to transmit those to their son, Arthur. So Arthur's education is kind of connected and is meant to connect him to the older traditions of kingship. So when he becomes king, he's already established, he's already secure, he has these friends around him who will act as his courtiers, his eyes and ears in the country, and hopefully everyone will have invested enough time in Arthur to realise that there's no point in rebellion against the crown at that stage because the Yorkists have kind of absorbed, have been absorbed into the into the Tudors as a new dynasty that really looks very much like the old dynasty. Um, it's really Richard III's reign. That's the, the strange blip in this progression, in this continuity, um, because Henry VII marries Elizabeth of York. He's really picking a lot of the, the things from the Yorkist period and making them his own. And Arthur's very much part of that, but with all this longer term baggage about British kingship and mythology and literature all brought together in this this new promise of a new regime and a, a king who can rule for a long time. And outside of the grooming to become the next king, what did his relationship, his meaning Arthur, what did Arthur's relationship look like with his parents and his siblings kind of just as a day to day son and brother, um, did they have a good relationship or was it very much focused on, I don't want to say business, but kind of, because that was, that was his job was to become the next king. So um, did he have a good relationship with his family outside of that? It's, it's quite hard to see. We know that Henry VII and the court did visit him when he was quite young. So at Farnham, because it's not too far from London, a couple of days slow ride. We can see repairs and money and clothing going from the king's wardrobe and household to Arthur. So he's being equipped and clothed different seasons and his servants are being looked after. And this does continue as well, because I don't think Ludlow has the kind of infrastructure where they can really buy a lot of high quality goods anyway. So the, the royal household continues to supply Arthur and his household right through his life, basically. But I think that is a line of communication and there's lots of transmission of servants and clearly a lot of correspondence, which we just haven't got. It hasn't survived. So we can see from some of the accounts of the king and the court on the move, on their progresses at different times of the year, they go near enough to Arthur's domain, to his little kingship on the marches, to know that they would have visited and either met up. And Arthur, remember, could also travel around. We see him popping up in in places like Coventry or up in Chester or Shrewsbury. So he's not static at Ludlow. He's traveling around these lands he's been given to learn how to be king in. Um, and he's interacting with lots of people who are prominent at court. He's got friends like the Earl of Shrewsbury, who's quite a powerful military figure. And that gives you some idea of how well planned out this has been. Arthur's got a, a kind of safety net, really. Um, an awful lot of the people who surround him are the king's good friends. Um, like Richard Richard Poole, who's um, who's one of, I guess, um, one of Henry's relatives in that he has a descent through the Welsh line, but he's also married to um, Margaret Plantagenet, who's the Duke of Clarence's daughter. 
So that gives another element of continuity. And it also gives him control over the military resources of the prince's land. So Henry can see that Arthur, this is King Henry, can see that Arthur is developing independently. And it's almost like a, a kind of cruel opportunity. So Arthur's meant to be isolated and meant to be learning these lessons independently. And some of this is to have two centers of power in the country, because clearly Henry VII is not very secure. He's dealing with rebellions in 1486. He's got the Irish invasion in 1487, the Yorkshire rebellion in 1489, and then the Western Rising and Perkin Warbeck on the horizon and actually threatening him for most of the 1490s. So that's more than half of his reign under the cloud of deposition and rebellion. So having Arthur developing his kingship in a separate location with a kind of military structure around him gives a bit of insurance to the regime that some, if something happens to Henry VII and his family in London, there's still a centre of power that needs to be overcome elsewhere. So Arthur's independence is a, is a long-term benefit to himself because he's learning those skills a bit more independently than, than he might have done had he stayed at court. But he's also learning, I guess, how to um, how to communicate like a, like a king. So there's an element of kind of diplomacy about how he relates to the the centre of power at Westminster and London. And we don't really we don't see him very often in the records. He comes up to London a few times and appears in the the London records. And he comes to court. He comes to court to be made Prince of Wales and to be knighted in 1489 when his sister Margaret is born at the same time. And he comes um, at various points. I don't think he comes in 1494 when his brother Henry is made a knight and has a big tournament um, to mark that that creation of, of, of Duke of York as Duke of York. So you can tell almost by by that stage, even when he's only six or seven years old, he, he's not present often at these big state occasions in London. He's really focusing or being focused on building up his power in the marches. So by the time he's 10 or 11, um, this system must be quite well established. And we can imagine that he's, um, he's writing lots of letters. We know there's a lot of correspondence going between them. We can see evidence of, of riders taking letters and communication, but those papers just haven't survived. So we, we don't really have much idea at all of what his daily life was like. Certainly no household accounts have come to light yet either, so we can't see what his household was buying, who, who actually was serving him. Well, I've managed to put together a fairly good list of the officers and the, the servants who were with him, just because they were getting rewards paid by the king's household. So it's, it's quite difficult to, to penetrate into the detail that we'd like to have. But um, certainly the relationship seems amicable, if not a bit distant. Obviously, Henry loves his son and is distraught when he dies prematurely in 1502. But really, that's as much about the shattering of his plans and his dreams as it is about losing a child who he hasn't really lived with or close to for most of his of his life. So it's, it's a very interesting kind of example of how late medieval parenting works in that you have to almost look to the much longer term to build the right skills to make your children tough enough to survive what you know is likely to come their way in terms of challenges to their personal power or their ability to run the country properly, to look after their money, to make sure the law works for them, to be a, a good leader and a good king. I guess there's no point in cutting corners with that because not only will you potentially lose power as a royal family, but you'll also plunge England into chaos and having lived through the Wars of the Roses and been a victim of exile and um, kind of uncertainty for a lot of his early life, Henry VII is, is very clear that he wants his son to have a very stable and secure upbringing so that when he becomes king, he doesn't have to deal with any of these problems about dis disloyalty, about uncertainty of who's on his side amongst the higher nobility, the people who've got the military resource to combine and potentially throw someone off the throne. So it's a kind of... It's a kind of sacrifice of what would be a normal parental relationship for this longer term security that Arthur will benefit in his life from these kind of harsh childhood realities of learning to be a king on his own terms without the kind of very close safety net of the, of the royal court and the king's presence. And obviously it's ironic that Henry VIII has to become king in exactly those circumstances of having learned to be a courtier rather than a king managing lands and people and the law and the kind of higher relationships of 
negotiating with nobles on equal terms in local lordship, me measuring and kind of um, solving disputes which would arise for any noble in their estates. But obviously, again, Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor, hasn't had to deal with any of that when he was young because he was an exile from the age of 13 um, to the age of 28. So in a way, Arthur's kind of been given all of the things that Henry never had as a king and as a, as a young man. Um, and is, Henry's throwing these things at him because he knows he has to learn how to deal with all this because that's the only way he'll become a, a good king and a secure king in the future. So it looks like it's a kind of abandonment to some extent. Um, but I think what's missing is that constant communication and any sense of their relationship in writing, because clearly we don't have enough evidence to say they were physically present with each other for more than a handful of times. As I'm listening to you talk, I'm just picturing, it's just such a silly kind of dramatization of what of what actually happened, but I'm picturing him just sitting there working every day and learning and doing all these boring king things, right? Well, while we know that Henry VIII is known for his athleticism and all these, you know, his his uh, playing games and he had a ton of friends and things like that. And it's just such a different picture, what their childhoods must have looked like. But we did also have a question about, did Arthur have any of those interests that we know that Henry had? Was he athletic? Did he enjoy time with friends or, you know, jousting and all the sorts of things that we knew Henry was able to do that uh, we don't think that Arthur was able to do, but did he have kind of spare time ever to do anything like his brother did? I think he certainly would have done. Um, we know that he received things like bows and really good horses. So he would have been hunting and riding um, from a very early age. I mean, when he was made Prince of Wales, he, he basically rode his horse in public for the first time through Westminster, aged aged four, I think. So it's um, it's a question of what's the sort of package for a a young nobleman, a young prince. All of those things would have been open to him. Obviously, he has the resources to do anything he likes. We know he would have been a very good horseman, and we know he enjoyed things like archery. Um, so in that sense, probably extend that to say yes, he had a fairly normal kind of downtime. Uh, we know from the friends he did have like John Lord Grey and Griffith Abrees, and even um, Gerald Fitzgerald, who became uh, um, the Earl of Kildare later on in the 16th century, that these were very close friends who were very um, broken and distraught when he died, not simply because that was the end of their kind of route to power in the next Tudor kingship, but actually I think there was a, a real friendship there which they developed mm -hmm. in that sort of period between the age of 10 and 15, so very much an early teenage kind of close friendship just as as you're moving from boyhood to adolescence. And I think that's really important for how we might see Arthur's personality developing, um, how he related to other people. And of course, we've, we've kind of had it distorted by what we know about Henry VIII's childhood with his obsession with jousting and his cavorting and his drinking. Uh, the fact that when, by the time he's 15 or 16, he's kind of almost fully formed as a personality, whereas Arthur is still very shadowy and difficult to pin down because the records don't give us that same parallel information about his domestic life or his friends and what he was spending his money on. We know a little bit about his clothing and the equipment his household was given because the king was paying for it and sending information to get things made and purchased and sent up to Ludlow. And all of that is very conventional and very obviously high quality. So we can assume that Arthur's household was magnificent and had he had the right kind of presence, all the things you'd expect a king building this investment in, in a, a son who's going to rule um, would have had. So I think in that sense, I, I guess it's a big blank to fill in, but I'm sure Arthur would have had pretty much the same interests as his brother. Obviously, the personality type would have influenced how that manifested itself in day-to-day -day living. But obviously, it's an enclosed, smaller world, much more rural. And I think um, it would have been an outdoor life that Arthur would have enjoyed, really, once he was away from the classroom. And I'm sure that would have been a good balance, because Henry VIII, um, we know how his personality influenced how he didn't like doing business time. He much preferred to be out on his horses um, or drinking with his friends. And I'm sure Arthur was the same. We certainly get a little glimpse of that um, in the reports of his wedding night, 
um, which is very detailed as people recalled it much later in the 1520s. Um, but clearly he could, um, he could enjoy a drink and he enjoyed singing and dancing like anybody else at the time. So that kind of gives me hope that, you know, his, his private life would have been as much fun as his brothers and he would have made good use of all those resources he had as a prince to actually en enjoy himself um, rather than just spend his first, well, 15 years basically grinding away, learning all the ins and outs of becoming a king um, and having this kind of very detailed and difficult model to follow and work out um, that his father had imposed on him. I'm sure there was a bit of resistance to that, but we clearly don't see enough of that in the records to say exactly when and what it was. And we know that Prince Henry did that in terms of um, his willingness not to knuckle down and learn the things he had to learn after 1502, 1503, um, to prepare himself for that period when he would become king. It was quite a transition for him, but a bit of a shock in terms of how he had to change his focus and become the kind of king in waiting without that back history of training. Whereas Arthur had the back history of training, and we can see all of that. What we don't have is the, the, the personality side of things and the social life. But I'm sure it was there. And in between the two things, we probably get a, a good composite picture of what it was like to be a, an early Tudor prince, um, enjoying life um, based on all the resources that money could buy, basically. Well, I'm very happy to hear that because that helps me to feel a little less badly for him <laughs> to know that he was able to have a little bit of fun at least uh, I didn't know that about his wedding night so that's great so speaking of his wedding obviously we know that he ended up getting married to Catherine of Aragon but on his road to or I guess part of his road to getting ready to become the king there are I'm assuming that there were other royal brides to be considered or was Catherine of Aragon the only that they considered and chose? Was there anybody else kind of in the running for that? There wasn't really. Um, it was very early on that the negotiation started between England and, and Aragon and Castile to make this marriage alliance. And obviously Arthur was the only child at the time. So by the time the treaty is kind of really formalized in 1489, you do have um, Princess Margaret, um, possibly being born at the same time or certainly expected. Um, but for a long time, Arthur was the sole child. So the investment was fully in, in that direction. I think Henry VII made that decision quite early to ally himself with Spain rather than with France or with Burgundy or the Low Countries. Um, that was partly linked to the, the history of pretenders and plotting and the conspiracy he had to deal with, which were still coming out of... Margaret of York, Richard III's sister, who was a dowager Duchess of Burgundy, and obviously Henry had a problem with the French as well and invaded France in 1492. So that kind of closed those doors quite early on in terms of policy. Uh, his, his debt of honour to the, the Duke of Brittany, Duke Francis, meant that he kind of allied England with Brittany against French expansion in the 1480s. So that kind of cl closed off the French avenue for potentially a a negotiated marriage treaty as well. So Spain as the rising power um, was what Henry identified almost before he was king. And he had this, again, this, this longer term plan to build this connection to the, the new power that was Spain. Obviously, this is the time of exploration and conquest of new territories, especially around the, um, around the Cape of Africa, into the Indian Ocean, but also into the Americas. So Henry's either got some awareness of this and the potential of this, or he can recognize that the Spanish monarchs have got a, a claim to lands in, in Italy, like the Duchy of Milan and the Kingdom of Naples. And that's, again, a different dynamic for how European politics might work out. So it's important that Arthur is part of that negotiation. And obviously, a marriage alliance with with a daughter of King, um, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella seems in 1486 to 87 to be the very best option for a king who's vulnerable but with the Spanish at his side and backing him up in, in the European diplomatic field. It would make England a much stronger country than perhaps its resources would allow it to be had it had to do these things on its own. So Arthur um, is lined up with, with Catherine very early on, even when they're infants and young, young children, and there's lots of proxy marriages, lots of negotiations and renewals of the agreements right through the 1490s um, to the point where the Spanish ambassador starts to visit Arthur's household um, 
in Ludlow and his house at Tickenhill near Bewdley, which is a much nicer kind of country residence that Richard III, Duke of York, had built in the 1440s. So he's got a, a kind of country house and his big medieval castle, and the Spanish ambassador writes very glowing reports of how well appointed Arthur's position is, um, and we begin, we begin to see some of the the kind of conventional personal kind of communications between um, England and Spain with a, with a view to the marriage actually happening in person. And it's a slow process. And again, it's linked to Perkin Warbeck slowing down the establishment of, of Henry VII's security for most, most of the 1490s. Um, so yes, there's no real alternatives on the table. Um, had it all broken down, I'm sure there would have been another plan in the offing, but it never got to that point. Um, I think the alliance with Burgundy and the changing politics with France, again, it's difficult to see how that might have played out um, in terms of negotiation. And it's interesting that it was, you know, with Scotland that Princess Margaret's alliance was suggested and she met, went off to marry in 1503. So it's, um, yes, it's interesting. Princess Mary is lined up with Charles of Ghent, who's, again, um, it's a Burgundian marriage proposal 1508 um, but effectively that's again another spanish link because um, charles is son, the son of philip and joanna who's catherine of aragon's sister so you can see how the politics kind of are drawn together by these initial links and negotiations um so it'd be interesting yes to speculate who would have been available um obviously we've also got the king wanting potentially to make another marriage after queen elizabeth dies in 1502 Sorry, 15, after Queen Elizabeth dies in 1503. So the king is, is potentially looking as well to, to cement things with a different state with his own potential second marriage. Um, obviously, Arthur is dead by then, but it begs the question, how does Prince Henry's position come into the picture? Um, and again, he's, he's 17 when he becomes king. So Henry VII has quite a lot of time during Henry Prince Henry's teenage years to begin to see how this is fitting together in terms of diplomacy and marriage treaties as well. So it's it's part of a, a much bigger game. Um, and I wonder whether, you know, they did have some sort of personal connection. This is Arthur and Catherine. Clearly we've got some correspondence um, once the marriage is confirmed um, or, or the, wed the wedding plans are confirmed. Um, we can see them communicating uh, very conventionally, but more and more sort of personal opinion and personal statements begin to creep into the writing um, but they're still only 15 and 16 when they get married in 1501 so they're still kind of young people even though they've had this quite heavy responsibility put on them from a relatively early age linked to to statecraft and kingship and queenship and the futures they have as high status politicians as well as as rulers so yes um it's it's a good example of how romance is nowhere near these kind of negotiations uh, but i'd like to think that having married early having had a, a few months together over the winter of 1501 to 2 that they did form a personal relationship and all of that investment from when they were very young children kind of might have paid off in a, in a very idealistic and, and lovely time for them um which sadly you know, disintegrated in in april 1502 when arthur died that actually was going to be my next question i was i was going to lead into um, the letters that they had been writing each other. You mentioned that maybe there was some affection kind of showing in the letters. Can you, can you give us a little bit of um, a look into kind of some of the things that they wrote to each other? Yeah, I suppose it's fairly conventional in that they, they know they're going to be married to each other. They want to reveal something of their personalities ahead of the wedding. Um, I know a lot of people in, in this period would have married pretty much almost like like a blind marriage without realizing who they were marrying at all um but yes there's um there's a few letters in in the spanish archives and a few um letters that, which have ended up in other places and we we find a lot of the english ones in the british library now um and they do give a little flavor of the personality of the of the writer um obviously there was a language problem when i did meet in that arthur could have spoken French, but Catherine seemed not to be able to, and she didn't have any English. Um, so they tried tried Latin as a kind of conversation language, but obviously English Latin and um, Spanish Latin were also very different. 
and that didn't get very far either. But obviously, Catherine did learn quickly because we see a lot of her um, letters when she was queen after 1509. She's writing in English and signing her name with little codicils as well. So an intelligent woman who knows how to um, how to play the game of politics. But clearly, this is a different thing where she's trying to, to demonstrate her interest in England, her interest in a new husband, and kind of fulfilling what her parents want for her, which is to, to go off to England and, and be a good queen, a good princess until she can become queen. So there's a kind of weight of that convention behind but the correspondence that does survive gives a little a little glimpse of how two, na- two teenagers might manage their kind of relationship. And I think the wedding itself is interesting um, because Catherine is a month late. She's meant to land at Southampton in September. She lands in Plymouth, which is another 150 miles further to the west. So she has this breakneck journey across southern England to get to London for her marriage. And they meet for the first time um, about 40 miles from London, um, about a week before the marriage. And there's a good description of that kind of negotiation between the the two courts. But actually, there's a a lot of dancing and a lot of drinking and a lot of getting to know you. Um, And that seems to go very well in terms of how two people have never met and have kind of only existed through these negotiations of other courtiers and ambassadors how when they do meet, they seem to get on well. And I think by the time the marriage ceremony and the big pageants and the kind of enormous event that dominates London for a month, where they're the very focus of attention for all of these state occasions, again, still fairly young teenagers, they kind of are thrown together by this whole responsibility. And I think there's there's a good sign that that galvanised their relationship and almost as if they're the, the two teenagers in the room where everyone else is trying to do things for them. They kind of seem to get on as a result of that whole whole weight of responsibility. And I think that's that's quite a nice thing to, to see. And they were allowed to go together back to Ludlow as a married couple. I think there was some talk of them staying in London, again, because there was another little flurry of conspiracy that had to be put down at the time. And it was perhaps seen as important for them to go off and potentially have another heir on the way by the time spring of 1502 came along, which was clearly the plan. Um, once they're married, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't try and have children as soon as possible, because that's basically what Henry and his wife and Margaret Beaufort want to happen more than anything, is that next generation um, to be secured with his own other children ready to be extras and spares were they needed as Prince Henry was, but actually that wasn't the, the master plan initially. So that, that, that five or six months from November 1501 through to April 1502 is the, is the key period for how we see their relationship. And we can see almost nothing of it in the records in the marches. Um, if we had some household records, and I'm hopeful that there might be some still stored away which haven't come to light yet we have got an awful lot of material at the national archives where which we still need to get to in terms of things which deal with payments and potentially with um with complaints and disputes which might link to those areas so there's things we could try to try and look for this kind of evidence um there's always letters appearing where you least expect them so it's not a it's not a closed off story it just it just seems quite difficult to think that we might get that information to really add more depth and colour to that crucial period of their relationship. It's always kind of viewed through other people, and I think that's what's disappointing um, because we can see Catherine's personality once she's married to Henry VIII. We don't really see Arthur's personality at all. It'd be nice to be able to to fill in these gaps and see if this was a really important point in her life. Um, certainly it was an important point in Arthur's because it was kind of the culmination of all of this training. Um, but it's it's just just slightly out of reach still, and it's a bit tantalizing. I realize that we're dancing around this at this point, and we are hinting here that there's not a lot of information. We don't know what went on in those months that they were married, but I have to come right out and ask because you know that this is the part where everyone is waiting to hear me say it. <laughs> did they or didn't they? Well, it's obviously impossible for us to say, which is the uh, the cop-out answer, I suppose, but... um, Of course, but you can tell us what you think. 
Well, it's, it's really interesting because you think of Catherine as a politician and an ambassador and a queen by the 1520s who is seeing her relationship with, with Henry VIII disintegrating. But she has got this history of of honour and of um, a kind of upright intelligence about what she wants and how she conducts herself. And what she says, I think, has to carry a lot of weight. And she says that they didn't consummate it, their marriage. And obviously that the wedding night evidence of the surviving young friends of Arthur, like the Marquis of Dorset, who in 1528-29 is, is trying to remember desperately what happened on that that night in November 1501. Um, so Arthur is kind of performing in a way that he knows his friends want to hear. You know, um, there's all these quips he comes out with in the morning after. Um, and it's it's fascinating to kind of try and cut through all of this to see what, what might have happened, what could have happened. And then we've got this other period where they literally were together and without much else to do in a pretty cold winter on the Welsh marches um, in a in a drafty old medieval castle. Um, I don't think I'd have got out of bed very much in that kind of weather. So you would assume that four months together would have given them plenty of other opportunities um, to consummate their marriage. And that was what was expected. So it's very difficult to, to think how that wouldn't have happened had there not been an issue either physically or emotionally between them. Um, and clearly we have no evidence of that. It's not the sort of thing we'd expect to see in the reports because clearly it's the sort of thing which would begin to unravel the alliance and the relationship between the monarchs and this kind of investment in, in the relationship that going forwards has to be productive, has to unite these two kingdoms. So there's all this um, expectation that Catherine will become pregnant and an heir will be soon on the way in 1502. When that doesn't happen, um, obviously it's only five months, but it's enough time to realise that Catherine wasn't pregnant by the time Arthur dies. And they would then look to Arthur's death as some sort of explanation of why the consummation couldn't happen. I mean, there's some interesting comments in the Herald's accounts of his sudden illness and death. Um, clearly there was nothing noticeable when he was very visible at his wedding in November 1501, so he clearly didn't have any kind of debilitating disease or respiratory illness at the time. You know, he was performing in the glare of public scrutiny, uh, as, as everyone expected him to do. So, you know, there's been suggestions he might have had some form of cancer or he had some sort of tuberculosis. Um, I tend, tend to think that he probably died of, of an outbreak of sweating sickness, which was running through the area of the Welsh marches. It was very bad in Worcester at the time he died. So that might be the explanation that it was a sudden kind of a bit like like COVID, really, a bit kind of respiratory infection that killed a lot of people. But it kind of skirts around the key question of, you know, why didn't they consummate their marriage? And I guess they, they thought they had time on their side. Um, and sadly, they didn't. So for a while, it, it didn't really matter because the dispensation for Henry to marry Catherine, um, when it was negotiated, it all seemed fine. Um, this, when they went back to analyze the Latin of the treaty and the, and the papal letters, you know, they found a kind of um, area where there was, there was not, not certainty about the Pope's language, which opened all these doors about the possibility of annulling the marriage further down the line. Um, and obviously those circumstances were very different, but it certainly came to matter absolutely whether, um, you know, Arthur and Catherine had slept together, try to get pregnant um, and have an heir. So it's, um, yes, it's not something I can say anything more about in terms of new evidence or information and everyone else can read all of the stuff that's out there. I mean, it's fascinating reading, going back to the um, the deposition statements about the annulment in 1528, 29, which you can read online um, where the, the calendars of letters and papers have been digitized. Um, it's really fascinating to see how people thought about their memory and what they could dredge up from their earlier years when it really mattered to the kingdom and the king, how they presented what they knew or what they thought they knew or what they could remember. Um, it's, it's really interesting kind of the, the exercise of memory as a real important element of, of public policy and the king's personal position. Um, you know, this is like precarious stuff for Henry. He's still got no heir. 
he needs to know whether God is kind of condemning him for marrying when he shouldn't have married or if the way was clear and everything was fine. So clearly that weight of wanting to abandon the marriage to Catherine is kind of forcing the issue a little bit. You can't really read the evidence objectively because we know what the king wants in 1528. But it's um, it's interesting how it, it dredges up what was happening in 1501. Um, and there's all sorts of statements from Catherine's women and from the boys who were with Arthur, um, obviously now quite old men, um, 30 years later. So it's um, it's well worth going back again and reading all that and having another think about it because not only is it important for English history, but it, it really is a fascinating way of seeing how people worked their thoughts um, just to just as a way of remembering what they knew. It really is. Okay, so now that we've kind of brought up his illness, it sounds like um, you we don't necessarily have any firm evidence to describe what it was that he died of. And yeah. a little bit, I think you had mentioned that it did come on somewhat suddenly because he was not necessarily a sick boy you know, prior to the wedding or uh, prior to his later teenage years. But some of our listeners still needed some clarification when it comes to um, what did his illness look like? Was it debilitating? What Did it last a long time? Was it, you know, sudden and then he just passed right away? How did the whole thing kind of transpire? Yeah, I think it was quite sudden. Um, it was all around Easter. So he he performed at the Maundy Thursday ceremonies where where the, the prince or the king gives out money to poor people and clothing as well. So he was able to do that on the Thursday uh, of Easter, Easter period. Um, and he, he became ill and died um, three or four days later. So it wasn't, um, certainly wasn't noticeable or wasn't reported that he was incapable of appearing in public or, you know, looked very ill and likely to die. Um, clearly, it's obviously not the Westminster court. It hasn't got the kind of observers um, that might have created those letters and those reports that we could pick up um, other things on. I mean, it might even be, to kind of put it right out there, you know, a process of, of collecting that information and destroying the evidence that he was um ill and incapable of of ruling but i think you know the fact that he got married only five months earlier in a very very public ceremony that went on for weeks in terms of its its jousts and its banquets and its dancing and he's never there's never any commentary from the um say the chronicles of london or the ambassador's reports that he's anything other than a healthy vibrant young prince with his future ahead of him so i think whatever it was it either became manifest very suddenly and struck him down very suddenly as well. And it seems most likely in the fact that there's a, an outbreak of a kind of flu-like illness in the area where he was living. And remember, Princess Catherine is quite ill as well. She can't actually attend the funeral. Not that a convention would have allowed it, but she's, there's the pr procession um, from Ludlow to Worcester. And, you know, she is... In, in bed and ill for a long time. And I think um, the provision of, of the, the black cloth and all of the hearse and everything, they were almost building a second one for her, I think. They were quite worried she might have had it as well. So, And lots of people in Worcester, which, which actually becomes a, a closed city almost um, at the time. Um, and it takes almost a month, the month of April, between Arthur's death on the 2nd, right through to his, his burial ceremony right at the end of the month because they're waiting for it to be more of a safe place to, to hold the ceremonies. So there's there's clearly something happening in the region, which we can see from work having been done on, on parish records of, of burials, that there's a sudden rise in more people dying um, than is normal in different years. So yes, there's, there's a, suggestion, a suggestion enough that the outbreak claimed him. Um, and obviously, because it's an infectious disease, that's why none of the royal family go to the service in in Worcester and it's the Earl of Surrey who's the chief mourner um so it's it suggests that yes I think um it's a dangerous place to go because of the reason for his sudden death and he is um 
I think he's embalmed quite quickly. And there's an awful lot of, of herbs brought up to actually keep that process underway as fast as possible. So he can basically lie as an embalmed um, body for a long time before he's buried. Um, and it, at least it is a kind of springtime. So they're available, but it's beginning to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period where you think, well, they're obviously waiting against what would be their better judgment. They, I'm sure they would have preferred to have buried him really quickly, um, but that doesn't happen. So it's clear, they're clearly waiting for something to pass before they can do the ceremony in, in the appropriate way. So I think that's, that's what I would say. He was a victim of something which struck down a lot of people. Um, there's little suggestions that he, he was perhaps at the time of his death, you know, affected physically. There's something about his skin being pressed inwards, or maybe it's some, one of the Herald's reports um, suggests that, you know, there was an effect on his appearance by the illness he had, which I suppose if you were, if you were kind of dying of a respiratory illness quite suddenly, it would have been a very dramatic change as your body kind of began to shut down. So that might explain that. But again, it's it's too vague. There's too little of it to, to build anything on, really. And I'm sure that he had periods of illness in his life, as everyone would have done. Um, we, we certainly have evidence of his you know, apothecaries and the doctors that were appointed to him. But, you know, everyone was ill at different times in this period. So it, it, to say that he was never ill would be silly. But actually, you know, he was he was strong enough at the time of his marriage for no one to go, Crikey, she's marrying someone who's going to be dead in five months. Um, that's that's a bit of a a misstep for the alliance. You know, there's no, there's none of that. I think everyone assumed he was a, a prince that would become king in the next decade after this. Um, and Henry the Seventh certainly wanted him to be married because he kind of wanted to take his foot off the gas, really, and begin to say, "We can pass more to my son in terms of taking on the reins of power from this point onwards." So none of that would have been in the king's thinking had he knew, had he known that his son either was not up to the job physically or couldn't sustain the attention that he needed to actually run the kingdom in the way that Henry VII wanted. Um, there's no sense of panic. There's no kind of strange hiding of information so that the marriage could have taken place against the facts of, of Arthur's illness and inability to, to be a king. I think none of that was there. But of course, we'd not expect to find any of that because that's kind of, again, counterproductive for the whole bigger picture of the, the relationship between the country uh, and Spain. So it's, um, again, another one of those where it's speculation. You, you're picking up the scraps and potentially making them into more than they are. I think it's um, it's it's more more likely to have been this kind of mass illness and just the unlucky position of catching something um, at the wrong time. The very wrong time, yes. Um, so now that we've kind of touched on his death, a lot of the questions that we've got left from our from our listeners have a lot to do with what would have happened had he lived. And I know that these types of questions are always subjective for our guests um, and our experts, but I do think that it's helpful for people to kind of put together the picture the what if picture. So we've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, if, if he would have been different or better or worse than Henry, what England would have looked like uh, if Arthur had stayed the king. So do you have any insight for us that would help answer to some, some of those questions? You know, some people wanted to know about the Reformation. Would that have still happened? Do you think that, that, Catholicism would have just stayed prevalent in England had Arthur remained king. What do you think would have been kind of the the bigger things that really changed during Henry VIII's reign that maybe might have not happened or would have happened um, if Arthur stayed in or had gotten to become king? Yeah, they're great questions because it does make us think about how everything moves in terms of politics and society and, and what, what little things can change the future. So I think um, clearly the Reformation would have still been happening in Europe and England would have had to have dealt with that in a similar way that it had dealt with the, the Lollards in the 14th century. So 
Henry the Seventh was a very conventional king in terms of his piety and religion, and I guess Arthur had a similar kind of upbringing in the church, and certainly his his one of his main guardians was William Smith, the Bishop of um, Coventry, who became Bishop of Lincoln, and very much a, a traditional kind of churchman. Um, and other other churchmen had, had been around his household too, so that, that all suggests that Arthur's kind of religious beliefs were very conventional, um, as Henry the Eighth's were for certainly the first. 15 or 20 years of his, of his um, certainly the f- first 10 years, 15 years of his reign, a uh, defender of the faith and all of that, caps, caps of, of maintenance from the Pope. So it's only when Henry wants a different solution and Cromwell can offer the kind of financial um, windfall of the monastic lands and dissolving the, the monastic lands in the 1530s that we get a kind of clash between what is the Reformation a religious change and what is actually a land grab by the king to um to fund all the things he'll have to do when he doesn't have the church to rely on so um in that sense i guess arthur probably wouldn't have dissolved the monasteries in the same way because he didn't have a need to annul his marriage in the way that henry the eighth did by by the end of the 1520s and that's kind of a financial process as much as it's a an expression of religious change by that point, but clearly the the church is presented as being corrupt and worthy of being brought down, which is how Cromwell sells it to the king. Um, but Henry basically wants the money, and I think that's the bottom line. It's got a, not a lot to do with religious change for the king at that point. So Arthur, as a conventional Catholic ruler, allied to a very strongly Catholic Spain, um, I'm sure that would have been a a very solid alliance for much of his life. And we might have seen Arthur living, you know, into the 1540s or 50s um, if he he lived a good life to be be an old man and didn't suffer those rebellions and depositions and the stress of trying to keep the throne that his father had had gone through. Um, And it really was very stressful for Henry VII. And I think that's what drove him to an early-ish grave in in his kind of 53rd year or so. So it's... um, it's very interesting to speculate on that side of it. So yes, I think Arthur would have still had to deal with the consequences of the Reformation happening in Europe, but his links to Spain might have made him a very kind of defender of a very strong defender of the, the papal power and the Pope's influence. Um, but beyond that, we can't say because circumstances would have changed and politics and religion would have taken all sorts of twists that we just can't predict because different personalities would have been involved in different countries and it might have all taken a very different turn. So, yeah, we can, we can say where the starting points were, but not necessarily where things would have gone. So that's, that's, that's one thing about the kind of church on the, the kingship side and the the difference between him and his brother as rulers. Well, clearly we can't, um, we can't say what kind of things Arthur did, but we can see in the way he he ruled, I suppose you could say, ruled the counties of the Welsh marches between kind of the River Severn right up to Chester, which is a good, you know, more than 100 miles of land. Um, he was a very effective ruler, even as a, a younger teenager where he was beginning to exercise personal authority and do things as a king would have done. So making judgments in court writing quite stern letters to senior nobles, telling them off for things, um, appearing in public and being seen to be a, a very well-dressed, magnificent king, doing all the kind of PR jobs that kings had to do to make people stay loyal to them, basically, um, to appear to be a good king and to do good kingly things, made people say, well, you know, he's he, he's got my vote, you know, he's a king I can believe in and I'll stay loyal to him rather than the guy who might come along and say, you know, this, this king has no rights. Arthur's... Arthur's got all over all of that in terms of his ancestry. He's kind of combined all of this stuff, as I said earlier. So he can command people's loyalty for who he is and how he's learned to be a king, but also his ancestry kind of heads off all these threats that Henry VII had to deal with for not being um, a kind of clear enough candidate for the throne when his when his wife clearly was. So Arthur's, Arthur's developed all this... Um, as a way to bolster his own power. And he's beginning to appear more in London um, from 1499. So he's aged sort of 12, 13. He's more of a presence at court. Um, Remember, Prince Henry is 
Um, well, he's born 1491, so he's he's a three years younger than Arthur. So we see him slightly behind. He hasn't had to be a particularly strong and active prince in the 1490s. He is the insurance policy. Um, and obviously there's Prince Edmund as well. Uh, he dies in 1500 as a, as a youngish kind of toddler, I suppose, about 18 months old. Um, so Henry's seen kind of his, his siblings die in the Royal Czech nursery um, in his earlyish life. And then he hears of Arthur's death. He doesn't obviously know Arthur very well at all. They, I think they, they kind of have interactions at Arthur's wedding in, in 1501 when Henry's 10. Um, but obviously Arthur's 15. So it's a, it's a very different kind of relationship by then. Someone who's still quite a young, a young boy, someone who's an older teenager, with this kind of weight of responsibility and expectation behind him to be a king, um, how well they would have got on, we don't know. It's it's clearly um, Queen Elizabeth's death in 1503 that is very damaging to Henry the the Eighth, Prince Henry as a as a kind of impactful event on his on his personality. Um, that's that's more of a, a thing that affects him, I suppose, because he he's already dealing with with Arthur's absence because of the change of role he has to now um deal with um you know he's suddenly the prince of wales and all those princely things are on his shoulders now but the death of his mother I, I kind of i think that's taken away a lot of a lot of the comfort he had in his life and perhaps she'd been a real presence in his education and you know his his domestic life um so when she's not there it's another the stripping away of the things that Henry had perhaps relied on, and he now knows he's, he's becoming more and more. Um, the expectation is that he's becoming more and more self reliant and visible in his own right. So that that kind of builds as some sort of resentment against Arthur, I suppose. Not only as a as an image of an idealized brother, who's also a king that his his father Henry the Seventh has invested all this time and money in in training him and resourcing him to be a a king in his own right, whereas Henry's had a nice life. He's never wanted for anything, but he's never been given anything to do in terms of ruling somewhere or being responsible for negotiating a treaty or presiding over a, a series of court cases or something like that or a sessions uh, where you know people's lives and deaths would be at stake, which I think Arthur did in terms of you know assizes and and courts in the Welsh marches. So they're kind of aspects of their responsibilities were very different and i think because arthur dies and henry the seventh and queen elizabeth then decide to have another child and then the queen dies just after giving birth to her daughter in february 1503 henry can kind of blame arthur for that happening because had arthur not died that circumstance wouldn't have un unfolded in the same way so that then is kind of parked until the late 1520s where Arthur's relationship with Catherine suddenly becomes really important. And again, the, the overshadowing of Henry's life by his brother comes back to, to kind of be very present again. And I think it kind of reminds him that he never had that investment, um, not so much of affection and that kind of connection to his family, which he must've had around the court, but you know, that equipping him in the right kind of way to rule effectively. I think Henry's had to learn what he can from the catch-up process he was part of after 1503. And that's kind of, that momentum is still there when he becomes king in 1509. So Arthur's always there as a reminder of where the Tudor crown would have gone had everything worked out as Henry VIII, as Henry VII had wanted, um, in terms of all that investment and training, becoming the kind of supporting skills that the new king would have had in whenever Henry the seventh had died. Um, whatever Henry the eighth brought with him when he became king in 1509, it wasn't anything like the kind of blueprint that the Tudors, had, uh, Henry the seventh and Margaret both had kind of laid down in the 1490s. So that relationship was very indistinct and perhaps very, distant really not just ge geographically but when they did meet you get a sense that the age gap was already too much for them to have a decent relationship 
um, and they weren't together often enough for that to actually have made much impact on their lives as brothers. But obviously it then overshadows Henry VIII as he's searching for an, an heir right the way through the sort of early 1520s, right through that decade. Um, and the consequences of Arthur's early death are still there, you know, when Henry's almost um, into his 30s and 40s. Well, for for someone about whom we really don't know much, I have to say, Sean, you've really given us a very comprehensive, clear picture of his life. So I've got to thank you for your time uh, and sharing all your knowledge with us today. Uh, I think you really did a great job. And I think all of our listeners got basically every question was answered. So thank you so much for that. Of course, thank you so much, Sean Cunningham, for all your Arthur information for us today. Before I let you go, um, I know that you've got a couple of books out. So would you like to let everybody know where they can read the things that you've got available and uh, what they are, where we can find them? Yeah, thanks very much. There's, um, there is a book about Prince Arthur, which came out in 2016 um, from Amberley. And it's, it's meant to be a, well, a longer version of what we just talked about, really. All those elements of his life that I could incorporate are all there to be read about. But obviously, there's many more avenues to follow and more things have been found since then. Um, so that's that's the main book about Arthur. I've got um, another book about Henry VII and I've got one of the Penguin Monarch series on Henry VII coming out hopefully early next year. But I'm doing um, a big book with James Ross from Winchester University on the nature of, of early Tudor kingship and about the projection of power and how it was received in the count, in the counties and also in um, in overseas areas. And that's the product of um, the Tudor Chamber Books project that we ran a couple of years ago, which created this website at the University of Sheffield, which is the transcription of all of the, the spending books of the royal household um, up to 1521. So it's a good resource for learning what the king spent his money on and the queen as well as one of the queen's books is in there for Elizabeth of York. So that's the kind of product of that project, which is trying to look at how what the king was paying for reveals what his interests were and his priorities. And Arthur pops up in, in that a few times as well. So there's a bit more in, in that forthcoming book for Oxford University Press, hopefully uh, probably out early next year, I guess, realistically. But that's got a lot of new research in about Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth, and their children. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we will all keep an eye out for that. And again, if you have any more questions or would like to ask anything to either myself or to Sean, um, just catch us on Twitter. And thank you so much for listening. And thank you for joining us, Sean. Thanks very much indeed. I really enjoyed it. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 